Spanish. No. Ok, eh, buenos días a todos. El día de hoy estamos en charlas de economía en la Universidad de Ciencias con Rachel Franklin. Rachel es profesora de análisis geográfico en el Centro para Estudios del Desarrollo Urbano Regional de la Universidad de Newcastle. Y ella, su fácil de investigación es eh, demografía espacial. Y ella es la editora del Journal Geographical Analysis y ha sido... Eh, miembro, miembro de los comités editoriales de varios eh, journals de ciencias regionales y geografía, entre ellos el journal de Regional Science. Eh, Rachel, eh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm done. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was. I was. Yeah. Just... I, I just I couldn't tell. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me. I look forward to talking to you this morning about recent research that I have done, and it's collaborative research with a former postdoc, Eric Seymour, uh, and a research associate, um, Vera Will Violet, both of whom have now moved on to permanent jobs in the US. So all of this is work um, that was done with them. I could not have done it alone. And I look forward to talking to you for the next probably 40 minutes or so about how we think about the geography of population loss in a United States context. And let me, okay. And so probably when you think about population loss, if you think about population loss, you think about it in maybe an Asian context, Japan, for example, or maybe a European context, um, Southern Europe, Central Europe, even Germany, but actually population loss at sort of a local or regional scale affects pretty much every country in the world in some way. And it matters. When we think about population loss, usually we think about aging. So we think about age structure of particular countries or regions where the average age of the population gets older and older. And you have fewer and fewer at the bottom. And this could be children, but it's also working age population. So eventually, especially countries, we tend to think about the challenges of having a shrinking workforce. So from a national point of view, it could be about the entire size of the country. Um, but from an economics point of view, we're often thinking about sort of the, the working age population, the labor force, and then those who are dependent on that labor force, so children and the older population. But of course, there's a geography to population loss. So we can think about shrinking cities. So cities that become smaller, this happens, especially in a US context or in a European context but also rural depopulation. And this results often from people moving to cities. So urbanization carries with it often this sort of depopulation of, um, of rural areas. To me, this is interesting because it involves infrastructure provision. So when you lose population in a given area, the density of the population decreases. So how do you collect garbage? How do you provide fire services? How do you think about social cohesion when there are fewer and fewer people in the same amount of territory? And for most, uh, most regions, certainly in a US context, population loss carries fiscal challenges because we tax locally and regionally as well as nationally. So if you are a city losing population, and I have a photo here on my slide of Flint, Michigan, where you can see just for one little piece of a street, houses that are still occupied and houses that are not only vacant, but uh, uninhabitable. That is, no one could move into those houses if they wanted to. So you can think about sort of how people live on a street like this, but you could also imagine if you're the city of Flint, you now have a smaller tax base to collect taxes from, especially from property, um, but you still have to provide the same services and you have increasing sort of urban challenges in terms of vacant properties and maintaining infrastructure that was built for a larger population. Right. And as I noted, uh, depopulation or decline or shrinkage is a reality for most countries, even the ones that are growing. And I have also a photo here taken from the back of a bus in Germany that says demographic change is coming to everywhere. And it's, it's arguing basically that we should deal with it now or give attention to it now instead of just ignoring it. Right. And so what I'm going to do in this talk is talk about how we measure population loss. And this is especially from a geographic standpoint. I'll then give you an overview of the landscape of population loss in the US, 
how we developed our classification or our typology, who's impacted, so the people on the ground in places that are losing population, and then some conclusions. And I really look forward to your questions and your comments. And I will probably say this later when I get to my maps, but if you've been thinking about the US election this week, one of the big stories about the election, aside from who's going to win, is the geography. It's about how different places vote differently and not only in terms of attitudes, candidates, but also the actual mechanisms of votes, how those votes will be counted. And so the geography is really important here, uh, especially in a US context, but I think probably for every country, right? So you probably have never thought about this, but I have, and that is that measuring population change, so growth or loss, is actually pretty tricky. It's not straightforward, even though it's presented as a straightforward, easy to calculate statistic, right? So it's challenging. And one challenge is the spatial challenge, right? This is both sort of conceptual and theoretical. So what is the right unit? If we want to say that a city is losing population, are we talking about formal boundaries for the city? Are we talking about a metropolitan area? If it's a metropolitan area or a functional or uh, economic area, what are the boundaries of that, right? So you change the unit and you change the measure of population change. But boundary changes are tricky too. So in a US context, um, but this is typical for most statistical agencies, as places grow or as they shrink, the boundaries change. We change what the units are. So this becomes analytically complicated, right? But there's also the question, what I call here the modifiable temporal unit problem, which is, well, population change is two time periods. It's a starting period and an end period. If you shift that window, you shift the amount of population change. So this is a little bit like in, in inferential statistics when we talk about sort of the true but unknown value. If we want to know something about the demographic change in an area, what are the correct temporal units and spatial units that are going to help us get at what a place looks like on the ground for the people who live there. Yeah. And from a geographical perspective, uh, and what I'm going to argue here is that the, this, this measure of population change for a given unit, for a given time period is also contextual. So the loss that a city like Detroit, for example, has experienced in the last 10 years is also a function or related to the change that's occurring around Detroit, right? But also what happened in the last time period. So you could think about whether change has, whether a place has been losing population consistently for a long period of time, and also whether a place is losing population and its neighboring areas are also losing population or they're growing. These different components tell us a lot about what the underlying process of population loss looks like, right? And then we have this other challenge, which is people versus area. So if you read in this sort of shrinking cities or depopulation literature, we often talk about the number of places, the number of large cities that have lost population, the number of small cities that lose population, but people are not the same as places. You could have lots of areas losing people, uh, but not have very many people impacted by that loss because they didn't have very many people to start with. And that is certainly the, the case in the US where many of our shrinking areas, especially the rural ones, don't have large numbers of population to start with. So we could imagine from sort of the spatial uh, conceptual point of view that on the left, we have one small area and this could be a neighborhood, it could be a city, it could be a county or a region. It's losing population, but there's growth everywhere else around it, right? This means, especially from a policy point of view, that we might think about very targeted policies that are only related to this particular place because everywhere else seems to be thriving, right? This is different from a place in the middle, for example, that's losing population and everyone around it has also lost population, even though the larger context is one of growth, right? And then finally, we have the third case where you're losing population and pretty much everyone around you is also losing population. These are different spatial processes, right? Often when a city loses population, the, the neighboring areas have grown, right? It's a, it's a case of suburbanization. And so this might have fiscal impacts, but the labor market itself hasn't been impacted, for example, right? In contrast to 
uh, a city that's losing population in a larger metropolitan context that's also losing population in a region that's losing population. This defies sort of local targeted policy because you're only going to maybe move things around within the region and not lead to any overall improvement. Okay. And a nice example of this holding sort of geography constant, but looking at the time period is Detroit, which is sort of the emblematic flagship case for urban population loss in the United States. So at its peak in 1950, there were almost 2 million people living in Detroit. And now it's down to just over half a million, right? So we would say this is a case of massive population loss. If you drive around Detroit or if you Google photos of the Detroit landscape, there are many neighborhoods where it's very clear that the population is completely decimated. But if we were to look at population change and take as a starting point, say 1910, we would not, we would not see Detroit as a shrinking city. We would see Detroit still as a, a growing city. Right? So a lot depends on what our benchmark year is. Okay. So in our case, what we're going to look at are US counties. And these are exhaustive geographies for all of the United States. So every state is subdivided into counties or county equivalents. Um, and these are important because they're used for our building blocks for metropolitan areas. Um, they're also very commonly used in this sort of research. Um, most Americans would be familiar with what county they live in. In fact, in some parts of the US, you strongly identify with your county. And they meet the sort of policy relevance requirement in that federal funding is dispersed at the county level, either directly to counties or to metropolitan areas. And so what we're going to do for this research is focus on 2000 to 2010, and then use 1950 to 2000 for the temporal context, for the history of population change. And you might ask why 2000, 2010, um, but if you follow US news, then you know that we had an election, a pandemic, and in the US, we also had a census this year. So the most recent data for the entire country are for 2010. Okay, so all we use for our analysis, um, any way to generate our typology, is a tabulation from our Census Bureau, so our statistical agency for, for population, that counted, that provided the that provided the decennial count, so the number of people in every decade, but with 2010 geographies so that we don't have to worry about the changing boundaries at the county scale. We don't include Alaska and Hawaii. So what we have are just over 3000 counties in the contiguous United States. Um, and then you'll see later that I refer to some demographic characteristics of different kinds of shrinking areas. And these come from our American Community Survey and from our census. And then we also make use of some migration data that come from the IRS, which is our tax agency. So in the US case, um, population loss is widespread at every level of geography, but it's occurring in a larger context of growth. So between 2000 and 2010, the US as a whole grew by almost 10%. So we are a robust and healthy country where demographic change is concerned. But if you look inside the US, the picture is, is actually quite varied. So you have some places growing a lot and some places losing population. We had one state between 2000 and 2010 that lost population, uh, and that was Michigan. And it's more or less unusual for a state to lose population. But among our large uh, metropolitan areas, about 10% lost population during this period, and almost a third of our smaller urban areas lost population. At this county scale that I'm talking about today, about a third of the counties lost population. And then if you look at, at sort of the neighborhood scale, census tracts, about 40% of those lost population, okay? And so for me, as a geographer, I'm interested in this geography of loss, where it's occurring, um, at what scale, what's happening around places, and then what sort of the overall extent of population loss is in the country. And so to me, it seems like a big question is how we identify shrinking areas. If, if we think that only taking population change from 2000 to 2010 doesn't give the full picture, how else can we think about getting that full picture of population loss? So what we're going to do is generate this typology of population change for US counties. And then I'll show you a little bit about sort of their, um, 
their demographic characteristics and migration patterns to and from. So this is what the map looks like. This is what population loss looks like in a US context where anything that's yellow or orange is growth. And so you can see that um, a lot of growth is happening in the west of the US. It's happening in Florida and up the, we would say the Eastern seaboard, the Eastern, the East Coast. So Washington DC, New York, Boston. Um, and it's happening in metropolitan areas like Chicago or Houston or Dallas or Atlanta. But anything in blue or white, which sort of looks like it's disappearing, those are areas that have lost population. And these are counties. So, so what you're seeing is about a third of the US units that have lost population just during 2000, 2010 it's a lot, right? It's not a small clustered area of geography. It spans every part of the US, but we can see that we have some pockets where there's been sort of larger spatial clusters of loss. So what might make shrinking counties different from each other, right? If we were just looking at sort of demographic change for a given time period, um, how might we separate out the extent of loss across shrinking counties? One, of course, is just the amount of change. Did you lose 5% of your population or did you lose 50% of your population? Because those are very different situations. But as I said before, another important characteristic would be what's happening around you. So if you have two counties that have lost the same amount of population, what's happening around them? Are they both also losing population in their neighbors? Or in some cases, are the neighbors growing while the central unit is shrinking? The temporal context will also matter. If you lost population in 2000 to 2010, is this your very first decade ever losing population? Has it always been growth? And then you suddenly lost? Because that could be temporary. It could be a mark of sort of changing um, distribution, changing economic structures, but it's something new that's happening to you. And then, and this is the part that's really interesting to me, we can think about sort of a signature or trajectory of change. So thinking about from 1950 to 2010, what was your pattern of population loss over this period? Did you grow, 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 shrink, or was it more mixed, right? Or were you shrinking the entire time period? And so just to show you a few maps, this is temporal context, but this map shows the first decade of population loss between 1950 and 2010. And the highlight here is really the dark blue counties. So these dark blue counties, their very first decade of population loss is more recent. It's in 2000, 2000 or 2010. In contrast to the lightest green counties, where the first decade of loss is already between 1950 and 1960. Okay, So a lot might have happened in between in the intervening years. But some counties have a longer history of experience of loss. And some counties are only experiencing it now. We can also look at the number of decades that a county has lost population, right? So here, the dark blue are counties that have lost population every decade. So in every decade, they lost population without any sort of break, okay? And there's a clear geography to this. So you can see West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky, for example, so Appalachia. These counties on the whole uh, have been experiencing population loss for a very long time. And the same holds for the middle of the country. Uh, whereas in the light green, we have counties that only have one or two decades of loss over this entire time period. If we look at the change signature, so this is just a, a random assortment of counties that were chosen because they had different trajectories. Um, but from 1950 to 2010, you can see that for some counties, you have sort of growth followed by decline, followed by growth. Other counties have lost over every decade. Some counties have a more mixed time period. And what we hypothesize is that this is one factor that might help you classify counties, that might help you separate them. That if you could take all 3,000 counties and have a line for every single one of them, you could cluster on those lines, put all of the similar trajectories together. And so that's one thing that we're thinking about when we're developing our typology. Okay, so we have two goals um, with this typology development. One is to differentiate the county experiences based on this trajectory or the sequence of change. So that captures the historical or temporal context. But the other is to incorporate the spatial context. So to look at the change you're experiencing in a particular decade and also factor in the change that your neighbors are, 
are occurring, okay? The, the, the change that your neighbors are experiencing. So we use what's called sequence analysis, right? This is just an algorithm that's used to, to look at the order of change, right? So consider the timing, so the onset of when, um, when something happens. This could be population loss, but um, as you'll see, it could be other sorts of things too. How long your stay in a particular um, in a particular character lasted, and then the order in which the changes took place, right? And this is typically done for a set of categorical outcomes. You could see that this would be really useful in the genetic sciences, for example, where you're looking at gene sequences and you want to find all the gene sequences that have the same combinations of letters. It's also used a lot in the social sciences, in life course or employment trajectories. Um, so in the life course, for example, you start off, for example, as a, as a student, then you're single, then you're married, then you have children, then maybe you're divorced or widowed, then you retire, and then you die. And we might be interested in sort of the transitions. How long do people stay signal, single, for example, before they're married? And do they stay married once they're married? Or do they go in and out of, of being single and married again, right? And the same happens with employment, where you might start as a student and then transition into an, an apprenticeship, transition into a job. But some people might transition in and out of being a student, for example, or they might transition into employment and back out of employment. And you could, if you imagine all the individuals with all these trajectories, you could pick out certain types of life course trajectories or employment trajectories and put those kinds of people together. So we're doing something very similar, but for geographic areas. In geography and urban sciences, this is uh, has been done, and it's done often for neighborhood transition. So it's a little bit unusual to do this for population change uh, and, and for the county scale, but this is something that's done in geography as well. Typically, uh, for neighborhood change research, uh, what they do is take a wide variety of census variables, so characteristics of places, and put all of those into the pot together and then from a multi-dimensional perspective, try to pull out the similar attributes that neighborhoods might share, all right? So that you can come up with four or five different types of neighborhoods. You could have gentrifying neighborhoods, you could have declining neighborhoods. What we do is use only the county level population change for a given period. And we look at your change, whether you grew or whether you became smaller, and then we look at your average neighbor change and whether that was on average growth or on average decline, okay? And that gives us four different options for every county in each decade. So we have six decades in total. Um, and in each one, you could have one of four outcomes. So one is that you lost population and your neighbors also lost population. You could have lost population while your neighbors were growing. So you could think of this as being sort of the, the classical case of suburbanization. You could have been growing while your neighbors on average were losing. In this case, it's sort of um, cities growing on the backs of their rural hinterland, right? Or you could be growing and your neighbors are also growing, okay? And what this gives us uh, for- Rachel? Yes. Is this, uh, could we, uh, I, I instantly went into uh, more than a scatter plot when you describe all your four categories. Is it, is it will be more like a similar hot, hot, low, low, you could, hot, low. Yeah, yeah you could do, yes. Um, yes, yes, you could do this, exactly. And it would give you a sense of the extent to which you have sort of positive relationships yeah. between what's happening to you and what's happening to your neighbors on average. So that average neighbor change, you could think of that as like, like a spatial lag. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But what we do here is categorical. So mm. uh, this is a potential, a potential weakness in that you either grew. So if you gained 1% of population or 50% of population, you didn't uh, you're, you're, in, you're in C and D, no matter what the extent of growth was. So everything we collapse everything into categorical variables mm -hmm. um, in order to do this, because the sequences work on categorical types. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what you get then for every county are these six outcomes. So they, it's a little bit like, like genetic sequences, right? So for example, if you had A, 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 then you had continued loss and your neighbors were losing population over the entire time. Or 
I hear someone someone doesn't have their microphone off. Sorry, it was me. <laughs> That's okay. Um, or you could have, for example, continued growth that ends with loss in 2000, 2010. But you can imagine uh, the very wide variety of sequences that you could get from this. So it isn't the case that for your 3000 counties, you could take all of these A, B, C, D combinations and put them out and just work it out by hand, right? This is a lot of potential sequences that you get. Then we use a package in R called Traminer. Um, that looks at sequence dissimilarities. So here we care not only about how long you were in each category, so how long you experienced loss and your neighbors also experienced loss, whether it's four decades or six decades. We also care about that sequence of change, whether it was D-D-D-A-A-A or D-A-D-A-D-A. So for some applications, it wouldn't matter, right? You're 50% growth, 50% loss, but we care about whether you were sort of cycling in and out or you started off all growth and then all loss. So there is an option that allows you to sort of prioritize that similar sequences in this package. We then do this uh, for two samples. We do it for the counties that lost population 2000 to 2010, right? Remember, that's the period that we really care about. So we take all of those depopulating counties for this time period and we calculate the, we do the sequence analysis and the cluster analysis. And then we do the same thing for the counties that grew between 2000 and 2010, so that we get an entire geography for the, for the whole country, okay? So sequence analysis followed by cluster analysis that then gives you a classification and a typology. So this is what it looks like when you do the sequence analysis. For every county, you have a bar for every time period. And the dark green, those will be counties that grew in a decade and their neighbors also grew. The light green is also growth, but you grew while your neighbors were on average losing population. Anything blue is a county in a time period that lost population. So the dark blue, you lost population and your neighbors on average also lost population or light blue, you lost, but on average your neighbors were growing. Okay, so when you look at the plots, or when I look at the plots, I should say, um, I see some clear differences, right? So, for example, in the upper left with emerging loss, all of the counties had to lose population 2000 to 2010. So they all have to be blue in the end because that's the constraint that we placed on the sample. But for these emerging loss counties, they were experiencing growth, all, most of them, all the way up until 2000, okay? Um, and not only was it growth, but their neighbors were also growing, okay? So for these emerging lost counties, and we you give names. So a nice thing about cluster analysis is that you get to name your clusters. So for these emerging lost counties, this is something new that has just only recently emerged for them. Their past history has always been one of growth. You can compare that to the persistent loss counties below where in 2000, 2010, of course they lost population, but most of these counties, their neighbors are also losing population and this isn't new. This is something that's been going on for decades for them, okay? We then have isolated lost counties where you're losing population, but your neighbors are growing. And this seems to hold, for most of these counties, this seems to hold for the bulk of the time period. So what happens for them at the end of the time period, 2000, 2010, is consistent for the entire time period. And then you have your sort of punctuated loss. So these would be counties that are moving in and out of growth and decline. Okay, I, I suspect that I need to go a little bit faster because I wanted to show you some um, migration and population characteristic information too. So there's a geography to this, right? So I would say if we really were interested in counties that have been highly impacted by population loss, I would say look at the geography of these persistent loss counties, these purple counties, because these are counties that both historically and spatially are just sinking or drowning in a sea of population loss compared to our emerging loss counties, the green ones, which are located everywhere in the country, but are mostly surrounded by growth and are only recently experiencing population loss. Okay, so we do the same thing for growth. And the, the thing I really want to highlight here is that if you take your constant growth counties and look at that cluster, that cluster of dark green is counties that for the entire time period from 1950 on experienced nothing but population growth and their neighbors also experienced growth, 
right? If you put those with the interrupted growth, you get about a third of US counties that have known nothing but population growth since 1950. And, and spatially, their sort of their landscape, their context is also one of growth, all right? So when you compare this, you get, uh, I think, a very attractive map, but it sort of highlights for you that there's a geography to the population growth in the US, and there's also geography to loss. And on the whole, they're very different kinds of places. So there are some states in the middle, like Kentucky. Um, I don't know if I can sort of use my pointer. This is Kentucky here. So if you look at Kentucky or Indiana or Ohio, Tennessee, these, this area of the country, for example, where with every presidential election, we're a little bit unsure which way they're going to go. You can see that in terms of sort of economic experience, demographic experience, it's incredibly mixed, right? Compared to something like Arizona over here or California, where these counties have experienced population growth nonstop. And these are very large geographical areas. This means that if you live here, like around Los Angeles, you have to travel so far to ever imagine that a person might live in a county like this, right? That's been losing population forever. So you could argue that Americans, geographically speaking, sometimes have very different experiences of living in exactly the same country, right? Okay, now I'm just going to give you some demographics and sort of quickly give you some, just because I'm largely a migration person, a sense of like how these places have grown or declined over time. But these persistent loss counties, the ones that uh, were the dark purple and have been losing population for a long time and their neighbors are losing population, it's a small number of people who are impacted and a relatively small number of counties. So it's about 400, 4.5 million people who live in these counties in 2010. Um, and the reason I give you these statistics is trying to think about the fact that it probably matters what's been going on demographically. So in these areas, you live in a place that has been consistently losing population for a long time. And when you look around, all the areas around you also seem to be having a similar experience. These places are demographically really unusual in the US. So it's a small number of people, but if you look at how white and non-Hispanic um, these places are, I mean, this is very white for the United States in 2010, right? Almost completely white non-Hispanic. And if you look at the Hispanic population, it's 3%. I highlight the Hispanic part um, because for the most part, this is relative, for most parts of the country, this is relatively recent uh, in migration or immigration. So for the last 30 or 40 years. So if you imagine, a, a population that moves in from outside and has choice about where they locate, you can sort of see that by voting with their feet, you can see where the more dynamic places are. So of course the growth counties will have a higher share of population that is, um, that is not white. But you can see also that even among the shrinking counties, this is pretty unusual to be so white. Um, and of course this will change over time because these places, as they shrink, they'll get older and um, either no one new comes in or the new population that comes in is likely to be much more diverse than the population that was there before. We can also look at this in terms of the foreign born. And so again, you see that the persistent lost counties, um, they're not very attractive to the foreign born. So you, you might hear, imagine making a connection between economic dynamics and population dynamics, that there isn't a lot happening in these persistent lost counties that makes new people want to move in. So the only motor for demographic growth that these places really have is, is natural increase, is having babies, right? And if young people leave, then you don't even have the people there to, to increase the population um, from the bottom, right? Um, and they are a little bit older also compared to other areas. So the oldest, the oldest counties are the ones that persistent loss. The youngest counties on the whole would be in the growth category. And, and this reflects both immigration. So you can see that these tend to be, for the most part, the kind of counties where the foreign born prefer to live. Um, but when young people move to say metropolitan areas or California, so 
whether it's a city or a region, they bring with them their potential for forming partnerships and having children also. So these growth areas are benefiting both from immigration and from natural increase. Right. Um, I'll move a little bit quicker here. This is just to think about how places have lost population. So this is 2000 to 2010. And so there are, there are really two ways that a county can grow or shrink, right? We often think about migration. So you are attractive to immigrants or in migrants. And if you have net in migration, you grow because you've gained more people moving in than you've lost from moving out. But you also gain people through natural increase by having more births than you have deaths. These often work in concert, they work together, right? So what you can see for the persistent loss counties is that most of them, 70% of these counties, they're losing population through net out migration and through natural decrease, right? So they're being hit twice because for such a long period, they've experienced out migration that now they, they lose in every time period because more people move out than move in, but also because more people die than are being born. Right? And if you compare this to the emerging loss, so these are the counties that only recently start to lose population, you can see that most of them are losing population through net out migration. Right? Okay. When people move, so if you know anything about migration theory, um, but probably also human behavior, when we move house, we don't tend to move very far. If you think of probably most of our moves for any of us, the majority of our moves will have been just nearby, or we may have left the country completely to go study somewhere else, go work somewhere else, uh, but most of our moves will be nearby. So if you look at the emerging loss, what you see is that this is true. So these counties that are only recently losing population, 40% uh, of those moves are just to the county next door, okay? Um, and then you get 40% that are just to a completely different state. Not so much movement is happening in the same state. The persistent loss counties are sort of interesting because uh, about the same amount is moving to a different state. And you can see this is pretty constant, right? There's sort of like a, a steady flow across types of counties of people who just move to a different state. Um, but they're pretty evenly spread. So when people move out of a persistent loss county, often they're moving to a neighboring county, which is also likely to be a persistent loss county. So it's not, that, it's not that when people leave persistent lost counties, they want to get as far away as possible. Um, it could just be moving household and staying in the same general area. Um, I'm, I'm nearing my finish here. And just to tie this back to the election, right? So we know that half of the US population lives in a county that's experienced growth for a very long time period. If we look at their migration, um, trajectories or tendencies, you can see that if they start off in a growth cluster, they tend to also end up in a growth cluster. So you could even be mobile in the US and never actually see what it's like for those third of the counties that are losing population. And I think that on lots of different dimensions, we can make the same argument that people tend to move from one prosperous county to another prosperous county. And so they don't see poverty they don't see high unemployment, they don't see structural economic change because all of those things are not only taking place for other people, but they're taking place in other places. So it's just not visible to the naked eye, okay? So just to conclude, right? Um, I mean, the, the, probably my primary takeaway would be that if we're thinking about population change, whether it's growth or whether it's loss, we have to think a lot about what it is that we're measuring, that it seems like a, an easy statistic to calculate, but it's more nuanced than that and requires thinking about context. What happened in the past and what's happening to the areas that are close to me or further away from me. So what we do is this cluster analysis by looking at our trajectories over a 60 year period. And it, I think it gives us a really nice sense of how different places are across the US and how different their experiences are today, but also how different they've been over time, okay? So that the typology gives a similarity of experience, but it then puts those places on the map so that you can see where those experiences are happening. And even though it's not very many people who live in those persistent loss areas, 
uh, they are really different from the rest of the country, um, which I think speaks to understanding not only the kind of place, but also the kinds of people who live in places when we think about policy. And so other work that I haven't talked about today, these were two big projects that were funded by the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health in the US. Um, so other work that I'm not presenting has looked at more at these mi migration connections across types of areas and more about the socioeconomic characteristics of types of areas. So especially thinking about income inequality, for example, or racial and ethnic diversity. Um, but I think this is enough for today. And so oops, with that, I'm going to stop. There we go. That's it. That's me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Uh, let's, oh, we have, uh, we have already raised hands. Please, uh, Blanca, go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, Rachel. Thank you very much for being here. I, I have, um, I think, two or three questions, very short. Like the first one is just for clarification. Uh, and I'm afraid you already maybe said this, but I missed it. And it's about um, um, how the program works uh, when a county, for instance, have, um, let's say, four uh, neighbors, right? And two of them uh, have lost and uh, two grew. So how how does the program work? Uh, it um, you know considers the proportion. I mean, if the growth is higher than the loss, or or how does it work? So what we did was the average growth of your neighbors, and if that average was positive or negative, then your neighbors are counted as growing or shrinking. Um, a possible weakness of that approach is that you could have some neighbors that have larger populations. So a thing to do, and I don't remember if we tried this and it didn't make much of a difference, but you could imagine weighting the, weighting the population change and then taking the average so that the more you know, population loss in a big county counts more than population loss in a small county. But anyway, it's the average, average change. Okay, and the, the other one is uh, about, um, when, when you sh when, when you showed um, this uh, table um, with the counties that have uh, mm -hmm. persistent laws, emerging laws, then I, I saw that 40% of, of counties which uh, had experienced loss, persistent loss, uh, I mean, I mean 40 percent of people moved to another state. I mean they, they went not to neighboring con counties, but to a different state, I mean, right away. So I don't know, maybe this is because like there is nothing. Yeah, exactly. So you see that like 41% of people actually leave the state, mm -hmm. uh, maybe because there is not much to do like economically in, in those uh, states or something, right? I mean, like the difference well, I, I see that it's uh, it, relatively constant. It's uh, constant. Right? And this morning when I was looking at this, what I was thinking uh, was that I would like I would like to be reminded of what this looks like for the growing counties and the extent to which this is. So this certainly seems to be about a constant for all of the shrinking counties, mm -hmm. um, whether it's a constant across all counties. But it is often it is often. It's often lower. I mean, most, basically, you could think about sort of the, the propensity to move attenuates with distance, right? Most people just change houses, um, but they don't change jobs, right? And then you have the people who move within a state, and then you have the people who move further. So clearly, at least for the shrinking counties, you're uh, equally likely to move next door as you are to just completely get out. And that, to me, makes sense in the sense that these are shrinking places. And for a lot of them, there probably is not very much opportunity anywhere nearby, especially for young people. Yeah, it's true. And, and finally, I didn't, I couldn't get uh, the explanation of the very last uh, graph. Uh, this one. Yeah, I, if you could um, yeah. tell me. Sorry, tell me I, I could tell that I was running out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent so much time on the exposition at the beginning. So 
This is county to county migration, but we take them at the origin cluster. So where they were uh, at the beginning of the period and then where they end up in terms of the cluster. So for example, persistent loss, when people leave a persistent loss county, it's actually sort of interesting um, with a caveat. It's interesting that a lot of them just go to another persisting loss county. This is, I think a, this makes sense if you think about it because of the way the cluster analysis is structured, right? The way we did the sequence analysis is that to be a persistent loss county, you have to lose population, but your neighbors are also on average losing population. So what this is capturing is that when people move and they cross a county boundary in a persistent loss county, um, they're very likely to end up in another persistent loss county, right? Just because that's what persistent loss is. It's, it's a larger region of loss. Um, to me, it's interesting because it suggests that people are really tied to place, right? That, they're, that people are moving in these loss counties. I mean, uh, when they move, um, they don't all move to a growth county. So there is something about being tied to your location that makes you still want to stay in the same region, even if it's experiencing population loss. Um, and then here, yeah. here you could see, for example, these constant growth, that was these bright orange counties on the map. So they experienced growth uh, over the last 60 years and their neighbors all experience growth. When somebody moves in one of those counties, they end up, they end up in a, in another constant growth county. So most of the movement in constant growth counties is just people moving between growth counties. So you're really, I think, sort of spatially isolated in terms of what your picture of life in the United States is like, I think. If that yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, yeah. Thank you. Hi, I have a uh, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, it'd be interesting to expand on home ownership. To what extent uh, the families that move or people that move are or are not uh, homeowners, because the the dynamic of the real estate market might have might have an, an influence. Uh, like in in the, in places with declining population, the price of real pro real estate and of homes goes down and people are in debt and they owe much uh, they owe more than they own i mean they are underwater as they say in english yeah so they are sort of trapped yes in, in, at least not sell because if they sell their property they will they will be they won't have enough money to repay their loan so maybe they could rent but then if the, if the, if the, if the market is depressed the, the rents will be low whereas in expanding in places where where the population is expanding maybe uh, people who have get, uh, buy homes with debt have capital gains and are uh, wealthier and are able to to move elsewhere because they of the wealth they have accumulated with the with the as the price of their home goes up. So is is that something that has been looked into in in this literature or? So there are a couple of papers on sort of the financial aspect. Um, Actually, there's been some in, there has been some in economics, like the, and I'm not going to be able to pull them out of my head right now, um, but on sort of population decline in an urban context that a lot of this is about sort of um, building stock. So I feel like there is an, I feel like there's an Ed Glazer paper and I feel like maybe um, if you email me, I can find them because I, I do recommend well, Jack Glazer has a whole book on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's definitely a paper on sort of like uh, building stock. But there also is a paper recently from um, Phil McCann and some others on sort of the financial underpinnings of this. So at the individual level, there is definitely like a first mover advantage. Like if you know that um, if you if you were able to anticipate that you were going to be seeing population loss in your city, you want to sell your house first. Because if you wait, you won't be able to sell it, right? It's not even a question of not getting money for it. It's that you simply can't sell it. And in the US, there is a point at which, and we saw this with the housing crisis 
in the last big recession, there's a point at which it's it, it's better to just abandon the house completely because you have to pay taxes on it and you have to pay maintenance on it. And if you, you know, if that is, <laughs> there's a point which you just hide, you go take off and you abandon the property. So in Flint, Michigan, or, and in Detroit, this has happened also in probably other parts of the US, but these are the ones that I've seen. You, when I talk about houses being uninhabitable, it's not that the roof doesn't work or that the weeds are too high. It's that owners have abandoned the properties. And then the only thing of value on the property is the piping. So people go in and they take out all of the pipes because they can sell that. Right, so that these houses are not even something that could really reasonably be refurbished. Um, yeah, and I think there's there is a problem that over time, if you live in a county that's lost population, even if you could sell your house, even if you didn't owe money and you made a little bit of money, that's never going to be enough to buy property in one of the growing regions. Right, so you you become sort of you're excluded from those growth regions to a certain extent unless you're young and you're not yet a homeowner, right? So a lot of this engine of change with the out-migration is young people, right? And this is, I, I haven't looked at this, but an interesting thing about the, about the US is that in the middle, like Iowa or Nebraska, these places that have largely sort of lost local population for a long period of time, their university systems are fantastic. So you pull, you pull kids off of farms and out of small towns to go to a really good university and they never go back. So this is like your sort of traditional climbing up a migration hierarchy. They leave, they go to the state university and then they probably just leave the region forever. And they start their lives elsewhere as renters and then sort of are embedded in those property markets. But yeah, uh, home, ownership, home ownership matters. It matters also for cities uh, and property taxes. So both the city apparatus and the household apparatus are both sort of negatively impacted by population loss. Hopefully that Thank helps. You, but if, you know, if you want more references, I can give you more economics references. But as I said, I'm a geographer, so I'm more familiar with what we do in geography. All right. Thank you. OK. Um, Rachel, um, I have a couple of ideas, maybe relatable. Uh, could it be um, in, into your persistent losses who move to persistent losses, those who are moving to the neighboring counties, a lot of those. Yeah. Uh, if um, that could also be highlightable and probably uh, the ones who move to other uh, states and usually that, that you got to my point before, usually the, if you separate by age, uh, the percentage of people moving to where they're moving to. If you get the jump, probably the a higher share of those moving there, moving out is the young population since they are the ones who have something to look for and they have the least to lose in terms of moving away and leaving things behind. But another thing that I was considering would be relatable to how these can affect um, the voting district compositions and the and the future gerrymandering problems in the in the states. Uh, that would be another thing that I would consider given the current situation. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so on the persistent loss side, um, an interesting thing is, um, yeah, what we, so I had this idea, which did not come to fruition, um, but I had this idea that in the same way that it matters how you count population loss, it matters when we measure migration, sort of what we're counting. So I'd I, I'm not trying to place a value judgment, but it's not necessarily the same that one person moving out will be exactly the same characteristics as the person moving in. And so that some of these regions, I think, for example, you get young people moving out and I'm not sure sort of who moves back in. Maybe some young people move back in, um, but then maybe you get older people moving back in. So it matters in terms of age, but it also matters in terms of human capital and in terms of income. So you could have 
lower income populations moving out that are being replaced by higher income populations. In a US context, this definitely can happen in some places because we have so much retirement migration, right? So that after people retire, they think they want to go live in the mountains or by a lake somewhere with rural amenities. And so you could actually see the, the population shrinking but the average wealth of the county increasing, mm. right? Which isn't necessarily then um, a bad thing from sort of a, a fiscal perspective. What was your, your second question was about, oh, voting, voting and gerrymandering. Yeah, I think that this, so if you, if you followed the census this year, and I don't know why anyone would, I do because I'm a population geographer, but, um, one of the big questions was how we count everyone this year and the Republicans really didn't want, they wanted to stop early. But the other question was who do we count? And traditionally in the US census, we count, it was certainly in recent decades, we count every single human being in the country. It doesn't matter if you are documented or undocumented. It doesn't matter if you're an immigrant or you were born in the US, you count every person and then you draw the districts around those counts of people. So an argument was made that we should only count citizens. And that of course privileges like these shrinking areas that are mostly white, right? because those people were born in the United States. They've been there for a very long time. So you give them more weight in our political system than you do the big cities where you have a lot of people who may not necessarily be counted, certainly this year. Um, so it's incredibly political, right? Where people are and how you count them is super political, definitely in the US case. Oh, I think you're muted. Yes. Yeah, I think it will, well, at least for this year and uh, for, for in the forthcoming years, it will change uh, this, uh, these outcomes in the way, uh, well, this depopulation will affect the whole structure in the way these yeah. uh, districts are set and everything. So, yes, uh, I, let's see if you have any more comments or questions. I don't think we have any more. Well, I'm happy to hear from people if questions come up. And I really thank yes. everyone for, for listening to me. And I really appreciate the invitation. I'm really thank sad you. that I can't go to Colombia. Well, probably in the future, uh, you, should, uh, you should come. It's, uh, it's really nice. Cali is really nice. It has, we have really nice warm weather. So it's between... Well, you are now fa more familiar with the metric system. So we're between, <laughs> we're between 22 to 32 every day. So it's wonderful. That's perfect. Yeah, I know it's really nice. So, <laughs> so probably in the future, we would like to have you here in, uh, in Cali and every, or if you, if you come. Um, yeah, I would love that. Yes. yes. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone and yeah, thank you. No, thanks. Thanks a lot. And if any, if anyone, tell, uh, if, if I get, if I get any more ideas from the, I will send them your way too. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, Rachel. Uh, thank you everyone sure. for attending. And uh, I will also let you know once we publish the video on, we are, uh, we'll send you the forms and everything because it's, we have to do this, um, yeah. administrative things in order to do publish this uh, the talks uh, but also uh, um, we'll let you know also if you if you want to have access to the video because our um, of we, we've got a couple of people uh, who like to have access to the video so they could share it in class okay. so we'll let you know and Again, thank you and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, if any students have any, any other comments they would like to ask uh, Dr. Franklin related to the... Well, somebody asked me if you have a working paper on the chat. Uh, 
I'm in the process of working on that. <laughs> I tell them to move and send them out your way. Yeah, I'm working on it. I'll try and get something posted before Christmas. It's just been a terrible year. It's, it is, it is, it is for everyone. It is, it is. And hopefully you will get to enjoy more of your home in the US before returning. Uh, thanks a lot again. Thank you. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.